So, yeah, thanks, Penny and Steph. Actually, it's really nice coming after Steph because um, your project about the language that we're using is really relevant for our project. I mean, we're having... Um, we are having some difficulties with not only the language but also the imagery that we use um, for our project. So to introduce Portalis, um, this is uh, something that Thomas and I are working on. Actually, I'll go back to the first slide. I've not got any names on it. Okay. So Thomas and I are working on a project called Portalis. Um, this is uh, also Martin Bates is here in the audience. He's on it. It's a transdisciplinary project. It, it's um, Island Wales project, EU funded, 18 months pilot project, and it's led by the South East Technological University and supported by the University of Wales Trinity St David and other partners. It is a very, very broad transdisciplinary project, so I'm not going to actually mention everyone who's involved. Um, but this is also one of the other problems because we're working, archaeologists working with curators, with designers, with conservationists. So the language that we all use is quite separate and distinct and how we, um, how we bring that together into something um, which challenges colonial legacies is, is actually providing quite some challenges to this project. And we kind of want to present this project to get some feedback as well and maybe some help in how we do this. So, as I say, the Irish side of the project is um, led by South East Technological University, and that's focused on South East Ireland around the Waterford Estuary and Dunmore East. Um, and the Welsh side of the project is concentrating on... It's, it's a Cardigan Bay um, area of research, but we're con concentrated on the Ceredigion area. So, um, the background to the Portalis project, it's a cultural tourism project. So, as I say, it's transdisciplinary and it's not, so it's not coming from a initially research-based background. So, the, um, the background to it is that it's a cultural tourism project. Six coastal communities have been identified, three in South East Ireland and three in West Wales. And Portalis is trying to work with these communities to develop a programme of events which are basically designed to increase tourism, particularly in the wake of COVID. Um, so it's focused on the heritage of these communities and coastlines and there's uh, various um, outcomes from the project. Two major exhibitions are planned in Ireland and Wales um, from March onwards. So basically, Portalis has set out to work with. Now, these are not my words. So this is the this is not the language that um, that we've used. This is the language from the initial project design. So it's about natural and cultural landscapes. And obviously, we're at TAG, and we know that um, you know that, that this is a bit too uh, kind of distinct. Um, and we're looking at parallels between ancient and new journeys in the context of climate change, um, which has also been slightly problematic. Um, so the f we, we started off with the first journey between Ireland and Wales as a tagline. Um, this has now been changed. So as I say, we, we started off, the project started off exploring the first journey between Ireland and Wales, dating back to the Mesolithic period about 10,000 years ago. So again, like I say, this is not our language. Um, we've now changed this to earliest connections, and Thomas is going to talk a little bit more about this. Yeah, I don't know, if, is this for the camera or the microphone? Do you need to yeah. swap it? Yeah, okay. Oh. Just, well, you have to swap that back and forth. Um. Okay, yeah, so clearly the, the idea of the first journey between Ireland and Wales, we felt from the start, which as Sam said, wasn't Probably, was probably no archaeological input in, in that when the project was designed. And we felt from the start very uneasy about this, and this is problematic. It's archaeologically problematic because we know that both West Wales and South East Island are drowned landscapes, the prehistoric landscapes, so therefore we can't find the Mesolithic coastline where those contacts may have taken place. But that's almost a mute point, that's beside the point, because 
of the colonial legacy that underlines the connection between these two places. And if you think about the first known journey in history, the first, the first recorded journey, we, we can't go much further than talking about the Anglo-Norman conquest of Ireland in 1169. And we know at that point that um, Strongbow of Richard of Pembroke, so from South Wales, exactly, it's just a little bit down the coast from where, where Portalis is in, in Carrigidian, sailed to Banno Bay, literally beside our study area. Um, and, 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 and the invasion, that the, the Norman invasion of Ireland, which is sort of the beginning of the colonization of Ireland, and in, in, in Ireland, of course, still a very sore point, um, start, starts from that point. And, and, and there's obviously a lot of iconography, a lot of literature, everything that goes with it. Um, Gerald of Wales followed hot, hot on the heels of, of, of Richard de Clare to write Gerald of Wales writing the topography and history of Ireland in, in, in the late 1100s. And, and, and the painting, very famous painting from Daniel McAleese from the 1850s, basically depicting Strongbow, Richard de Clare, marrying Aoife, the daughter of the King of Leinster, who actually is the person credited of having called the Normans to help him with a local dispute and therefore having initiated the conquest. So therefore, this is essentially legitimizing the Anglo-Norman taking over of, of, of Ireland. And that whole debate that's been going on about was Ireland the first British colony? Um, and, and that's still raging. And some people very mentally disagree with the notion of Ireland having been a colony. And, and Ireland is not extremely different in a way to Wales. If you think about the way Wales across its history has been exploited for its resources from the East, from England, for coal, for, for metals, for labor, for wool, um, so the way Wales has been treated in history is not that dissimilar from overseas colonies in many ways. So both of these regions on the margins of the empire, of the central part of the empire, if you want, have had that history of colonization. That clearly has an impact on, on the way archaeology has been done, especially from the 19th and 20th century. And we can't go beyond that. And if you ask about first journeys and initial contacts, then I think that overshadows everything. And then if you go further, there is also this idea that in, in, in Ireland, that Ulster, the northeast corner, and actually not just Ulster, because Ulster has also counties in the Republic, but in particular the, the six counties that are part of Northern Ireland, are sort of different from the rest of Ireland. And Estyn Evans, who was a, a Welsh speaker from Shropshire, who worked in, a, in, in Northern Ireland for most of his career, wrote about this very, very um, distinctly, how the Ulster people are different, the landscape of Ulster is different. So that's, uh, I would call it an exceptionalism. And, and this sort of followed in the heels of Cyril Fox. Most of you would be familiar with the personality of Britain, but essentially only England has lowland zones and uh, mid zones and everything else to the wild west, whether it's Scotland, Wales, or Ireland is, is uplands, is highlands, is, is, is rough territory, is potentially dangerous. And the impact on that is interesting from an archaeological perspective that then all the terminology, especially if you look at the Mesolithic in Ireland, relates to that northeast corner. So with the, with the discovery of Mount Sandal in the late 70s, early 80s, the material culture, the terminology, everything centered around the northeast and the idea, and still to this date, obviously the earliest dates we have for settlement in Ireland come from there. So the, the idea is therefore that Ireland must have been settled from that part, from the most British part, if you want, of Ireland. And then, and then the, the colonizers spread, spread out from there. But also more importantly, that all the terminology, going back to the previous talk, is referenced to that part of Ireland. Whether it's the early Mesolithic relating to Mount Sandal, or the later Mesolithic on, 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 the, on the right there, the, 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 the lithics, the Larnian or Banflakes, all places in, nor in, in Northern Ireland. Um, so that's really striking. And, and, and Sam and I have been discussing this. She found it's not as striking in Wales, but there is similarity, arguably, with Pembrokeshire compared to Carrigidian, for example, where Pembrokeshire, much more colonized by, by English people, much more English speaking, seems to be more significant prehistorically. There's much more written about it, much more research done. Nab Head, very famous site. Um, whereas slightly to the north up the, up the coast in Wales, things are seen as less significant. And that, that's impacted in so many ways how we think about early prehistory and the Mesolithic in particular. And if you think about these very famous 
reconstructions and in Ireland and, and, and beyond, a lot of the imagery around Mesolithic lives ha have based themselves on Mount Sandal on these hot sites and these dome-shaped tents with deer skin um, and, and, and all the life that goes with it and also the, how, how microliths have been used. Um, so therefore this is sort of these constructs, as I would call them, rather than reconstructions, have shaped the mental image of what life was like in the earliest prehistory, which is hounding us to, to, to this day, really. And this makes it really difficult with a project like ours that is meant to do a lot of public communicating, is how do we get beyond those images? How do we get beyond this very bog standard imagery? And, and one of the elements of the exhibitions is going to be a VR reconstruction. Um, and there's some, some sh that still, it's still in development and heavily criticized um, by the archaeologists on the team, but it's a really important aspect from the, the side of the grant holders of, of making that happen. But how do you do something like this without reinforcing all those old stereotypes of, of man the hunter, the bearded fella throwing a spear at, 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 and killing a deer and, and the women doing the domestic chores? And how do we move beyond that in that public arena is, is, is a real challenge. Um, Sam, should I hand back to you just to... Yeah. Um, just also because, because of the, uh, the nature of the project, so because it is this um, cultural heritage uh, tourism project, and as I say, it was design-led, it's not research-driven. So basically the concepts and themes were created before any research was actually done. So um, we've got themes like uh, hunter-gatherer, We've got themes like um, journey. first journey, uh, which was changed. So it's kind of we've we've been trying to work within these, and they're quite fixed themes. So we're trying to kind of come in and change the language and um, kind of expand these themes while having to stay within those confines. Um, so the difficulties. The, there's basically difficulties challenge all sorts of narratives here. It's not just the, the, the colonial, the post-colonial narrative. I mean, as um, you can't really see so much these stills, and I, I would like to really show you a clip of the initial VR because um, <laughs> it, as, as this was supposed to be uh, island, and you've got a deer. Um, obviously, it's the wrong information. Um, so it's yeah, we're sort of we're working from scratch really so um and as we were supposed to be looking at connections between ireland and wales this was supposed to be the first journey and obviously now we're talking about earliest connections so um thinking about the two landscapes uh we sort of thought a good way to look at it sort of side by side um it's cardigan bay there's been significant landscape change since the last ice age where it transformed from a lowland upland landscape to an upland landscape um, we've got humans that have returned to Wales around 1400 years ago at the end of the last ice age. Um, in Cardigan Bay, uh, we don't have any radiocarbon dates, so it has to be based on typology. So the main site that we have in Cardigan Bay is at Tannaboch, and there is um, typologically early Mesolithic material suggesting people ret returned to Cardigan Bay around 9,000 years ago. Um, the, the archaeology that we have in Cardigan Bay is generally sparse. As I say, Tannabol is our main site, it's our largest site. There's thousands of pieces of flint work. Um, other than that, actually, I'll talk about that a bit later. But yeah, it's generally sparse, um, mostly surface finds, and there's very little in the way of excavation. Um, Thomas, do you want to run through the water? I, I can, yeah, I mean, this is, this is basic stuff. Uh, yeah, and actually, we're probably running out of time, so I'll flick on. Ah, this is you. Yeah. Okay, um, I mean, just, just go back for, for the comparison, but there, there are, you can see some similarities. So, the first evidence from Ireland is still Mount Sandal, which dates back about 10,000 years, about 8,000 BC. And, and again, like, like, in, like in West Wales, we don't have a lot of dates for, for those early settlements. Um, the southeast corner of Ireland used to be a completely blank on, on the map until the Bali Lock project, which is sort of part of the, the reason why the southeast corner of Ireland has been dedicated or chosen for this particular project. 
And we have early Mesolithic material there now, thanks to the Ballylock project and the local collector, who I'll be mentioning in a minute. And so therefore we have similar, so we know by, by 9,000 years ago, and that's based on the typology that we have early Mesolithic material culture, people definitely lived in that, that part of Ireland. And there's no reason to believe if they lived anywhere in Ireland that they wouldn't have. Um, but it's now actually a really well covered region. This is, um, and, and like in West Wales, again, we are almost exclusively basing that on, on surface finds with, with a few excavations. But there's quite a, been a little bit of attention since the 1980s when Ballylock first came there. So this is my, my own PhD focused a little bit on Ballylock. This, this goes back sadly 15 years. Uh, but these are the science locations, the find locations in the in the area that we are particularly interested in. So these are all uh, surface collections, um, and, and some of the artifacts on the, on the on the top right there. But similarly, a local collector started around the same time. Uh, a local landowner there walking the fields in that same area, and and some of the fields are the same, which is really interesting. So we have the the Ballylock project in the 80s. Um, walking these fields once or twice with a lot of volunteers and then we have a local person walking them hundreds of times on his own over the years and comparing these two assemblages has been essentially my main contribution to that, that particular project. Um, just before he died, sadly, a few years ago, Peter Woodman came out to, to Creedon Head, which is the, the bit of headland that's just cut off there on these two maps. That, that, that's it up there. Um, and, and, and excavated a, a potentially early Mesolithic site there um, to, to add to, to, the, to the assemblage. Um, so there, there are these three quite different assemblages being brought together for the, for the lithic work. And in addition to that, we're focusing on, on that area because of that overlap between the Ballylock work, the Noel McDonough collection, which is the local landowner, and, and, and also Peter Woodland side. We're focusing on, on Fornock Strand, which you can see there squeezed in on the top which has been another focus of our research is on actually a kind of profiling the prehistoric landscape and in particular the, the submerged landscape off, off, offshore and intertidal landscape with, with trying to get some dates for the changes in the landscape. We know that the Waterford estuary is a drowned landscape. We know that sea levels continue to rise there and have been rising steadily throughout the Holocene, which is different from the northern parts of Ireland where we have raised beaches. Um, so we know that, but so the project we currently have, we, we've cored in the summer, you can see the points, and the cores are now being analyzed and dated to so hopefully get a really good profile of those soils and, and get some really good dates to identify how, how much of the Mesolithic landscape in particular has actually been lost to, to the incurring tides. And I think this is probably a good point to hand over because a lot of environmental work has also been happening on the, on the Welsh side. Yeah, so in Cardigan Bay, um, we've also been identifying environmental change from the sed sedimentary record. Um, so unlike the Bally Lock project, a lot of the work for Portalis has actually been carried out previously. So Martin Bates has done a lot of work on Cardigan Bay, as a lot of people will know, through, um, and the Lost Frontiers Doggerland project um, has been instrumental in providing a lot of our data for this project. So these samples were all collected around, well, from 20 years ago. And from this research, we've been able to map the changing coastlines for Cardigan Bay during the Mesolithic. So we have quite, um, we have quite good data, which actually we would be able to put into a VR um, if we had the right software to do it, to be able to recreate a landscape um, and a landscape of change. Um, so apart from the paleo-environmental work, we've also been doing similarly to Ireland. We've done a, um, we've done a, a review of co uh, artifact collections in Ceredigion. Like I say, only one really large site, which is Tannabolch, um, which was excavated in the 1920s. Um, otherwise, it's mostly small to medium scatters, um, which are predominantly from fields walking. Although we do have a couple of excavations. One was at Llanachiron, which is a National Trust property. Um, and the other one was in uh, Llantlir in, Ta in Tausan, which was um, 2019 and 2022 Lampeter student excavations. So um, this is the site at Llantlir in Tausan. Uh, this, so this 
big circle here. These were the trenches that were put up in 2019. Um, and this second circle here is where we um, also dug some trenches in 2022. In 2019, um, a small flintwork assemblage was found, including a polished stone axe. And in 2022, we, um, we have now got a collection of around 50 or so flint artifacts, and they've been, um, they're typologically uh, late Mesolithic. So where are we now? So, okay. Um, so again, going back to connections, I'm going to try and wrap it up because we're probably running over. In terms of connections, what connects pre, uh, specifically Mesolithic Ireland and Wales? So on the surface, um, it might not seem so much. Um, local materials seem to be used on both sides of the Irish Sea and material culture is fairly distinct. I mean, we've got narrow blade microliths for late Mesolithic in West Wales. Um, it's, it's not a microlithic um, uh, culture in uh, uh, Southeast Ireland. They have the butt trimmed band flakes, uh, tranche axes, and sharpening and flakes, which you don't have any of in West Wales. Um, but coastal communities on both sides of the Irish Sea experienced fairly rapid changes to their environment. Um, for example, um, uh, well, but basically, some of these changes, sometimes these changes, are actually seen as catastrophic when actually they might have provided new, well, they would have provided new opportunities. So for example, where sea level rise and flooding um, come into what is now the Duffy and um, the, Div Duffy and the Tivy estuaries, they brought different resources and ways of living. So, yeah, really the questions that we wanted to put out for you is, how, how do we bring Wales and Ireland together in public archaeology without perpetuating the Mesolithic stereotypes and post-colonial narratives? Especially something which is such a transdisciplinary project, which has got so many people involved in it. People who have no necessarily different experiences um, and yeah, different areas of expertise. And how do we get bite-sized chunks of, of alternatives that both engage the public and further their understanding? Um, so, yeah, coming back, is it about the language we use and the um, reconstructions that we use, the visuals, the images? Um, and I might, I'm just going to read out something. And <laughs> so this is, this is the... So we've also got some film, we've got some film that's produced by a, a fantastic filmmaker called Moira Sweeney, who isn't a Mesolithic specialist. So she sent me this the other day as an introduction to the Mesolithic for the beginning of the film and for something that we might use in the exhibition. So it says, Mesolithic, colon, the Middle Stone Age, characterized by adaptation to a hunting, collecting, and fishing economy in forest, lakeside, and seashore environments. And I read it, and obviously, I threw my hands up in horror and thought, I, this isn't what we want, but well, how do we do it differently? So I've try, I try to change that, and as I say, within a, a bite-sized piece. So I'm going to read out my... Um, alternative version and then I don't know if people have got other ways that we can present it. So um, my idea was to say Mesolith Mesolithic people lived in Britain and Ireland 12,000 to 5,500 years ago, often typecast as hunters, foragers and fishers. They were also craft workers, artists and musicians. These communities were connected to their landscapes forests, river valleys, lakesides, and coastlines, but they also inhabited rich cultural, social, and spiritual worlds. That's, that's where we are. <laughs> so, 